he had pretty busy recently. So he replayed the recording and they cannot attend the meeting. Maybe it is because the time is not really good for him. Thanks for the input. I'm glad you followed up on that. <laughs> okay, let's start it. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Zero Committee meeting uh, for November uh, 24th. I'm uh, hosting the meeting today. And let's uh, uh, first uh, update status and then uh, dive into the discussion topics. Uh, uh, start for me. Uh, we made uh, the RC1 release for uh, uh, 1.7.1, and uh, uh, we are doing some manually and automation testing. and. Uh, will make the GA list uh, in, in, at the end of this week if everything goes well. And uh, I have finished work uh, for the uh, AR plugin to support the CSA uh, volumes and also uh, submit PR to uh, address the issue. Uh, uh, the, rest, the restored PVs cannot be deleted. And we will uh, we'll try to uh, fix issue uh, 4009. Uh, the backup cannot be deleted after the application uninstalled. Uh, this is uh, this part for, for me. And uh, any questions or comment? Okay, next, Daniel. Uh, fix a few uh, minor issues and uh, also uh, merge uh, the PR for uh, CSR support, CSI support for AWS and GCP uh, plugins. So uh, uh, if there's any uh, community user, I mean, I've tested in the lab, but if there's any community user uh, who have uh, the real world workload that uh, use CSI driver on AWS or GCP to provision uh, persistent volumes. Um, please help us test them. Uh, um, and I'm working on the issue uh, 3516. It's uh, related to uh, backup and restore utility in webhook configuration. Uh, I have something to discuss about it. Uh, uh, we'll talk about it later. That's all. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, next, Dale. Yeah, so I'm just putting together PRs, some of the upload progress and progress monitoring stuff. And um, I had an idea for how to do um, multi-tenancy on a per namespace basis. So I wrote, I spent some time writing that up and uh, I have a draft proposal as a PR and we can discuss it if, if we feel like it during the discussion. Okay, uh, I think that we can just uh, yeah. turn to the uh, part to discussion the topics. Okay. Uh, so, uh, shall I? Sh uh, I think it will be easier when I, it will be easier if I can share the screen. Okay. Sure. Um, um, give me one second. Sorry. Also, uh, there, <clears throat> there was an issue open earlier this year. <clears throat> uh, the user said when he uh, uh, is restoring a V1 beta 1 meditating webhook configuration into a 1.19 cluster, it has a, a failure like this. Uh, 
the side effect uh, value is unknown and this is not supported in 119. Uh, this is because um, in 119, uh, when Valero doing backup and restore, although the, the resource was created uh, using the V1 beta 1 uh, API version, the preferred version on the cluster is V1. So when Valero do the backup, the resource was converted to V1. However, uh, after the conversion, it has a uh, unsupported value. So I did some uh, uh, quick test. Um, uh, if I uh, create a, uh, it's a uh, mutating webhook configuration. Um, then if we use Cupido to get it. Yeah. We can see that uh, uh, as expected, uh, the coup, uh, I mean, the API server will serve V1 version of resource because this is the preferred version, but it has this unsupported value. Um, uh, I just want to confirm that does it, I mean, um, if we uh, try to force it to get a V1 beta one. Um, yeah. So uh, if we uh, output uh, this one to a, a YAML file, this uh, will be, uh, I mean, uh, we can use this YAML to successfully create a uh, resource. However, um, if we use a V1, uh, um, we can try it, v1.yaml. We, we can see the same arrow. Yeah. So it seems that the API server will serve the uh, render the resource uh, to an invalid, to a, I mean, YAML file contains invalid value for uh, a side effects. So, so my question is that, uh, do you think it, it looks like a bug in Kubernetes? <laughs> kind of looks like it, doesn't it? The expectation should be that if you get something yeah. from the server and then put it back, it should be valid, right? Yeah. Yeah, I tried to talk to Nolan uh, last night, but uh, he, he's not available. So um, considering this one, uh, the V1 beta one will be removed in the newer version of Kubernetes. I don't think it's worthy to check with Kubernetes uh, community about this issue. It seems there is some error when the API server is doing the conversion. Yeah, and that's probably not, and that would require like an upgrade to Kubernetes to fix or something because I don't even see anything. So there's up in the top in the last applied configuration is the only place that I see anything that says beta. Right. So see what it says the API version there, but I don't think that's for. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think Kubernetes logic is that it will always serve until you explicitly tells it 
to serve the version you want like this, it will always serve the preferred version, which is the latest supported version. So in this case, it will serve B1. This is expected. I think the problem is when it's uh, doing this conversion, it should should not uh, contain the invalid attribute. I mean, the, the, the right. invalid value to the attribute. So, um, but however, we, we, we still want to fix uh, this issue. I mean, we already uh, have uh, this enable API group version feature gate to mitigate the problem, but we still want it to work uh, out of the box. Uh, we should be able to back up and restore uh, the V1 beta 1 mutating webhook configuration. And there's a user uh, propose we should back up resource as is. I mean, uh, his right. Point the is, question is, how do you find out what as is means, right? Um, yes, this is one. And uh, additionally, I don't think this is the right thing to do because currently when you back up using the preferred version, it's uh, most cases, the preferred version works it's because we consider we consider this one a bug for Kubernetes. So maybe we should deal with this as a special case. We can add a like a backup item action plugin to check the uh, version and the value of this attribute and try to change this one to a valid uh, value to like uh, probably none right yeah we could we could do that um okay i yeah. think that yeah yeah is it is it like a special case so we put that into the main valero code mm -hmm. as a compiled in option there um because the other option is so if if you run it with the feature um the feature upgrade um turned on the version version upgrade turned on does it work to the, uh, the enable API group versions. So if that happens, then we would back up the V1 beta one. It works. Well, then you have to, guy, but you have to do that config map. Yeah, this guy mentioned that that will work. He has this enable using the V1 beta one config map. But, but I think uh, the reason this one is prioritized is PMC sees the issue. So, I, I don't think by default we should ask T, uh, TMC to uh, create such config map always. I mean, for a user in a particular uh, case, he can use this as a workaround. But generally, we should still, the Velaro should, you know, back up and restore uh, the V1 beta 1 maintaining webhook configuration by default. Right. Yeah, yeah I think, I, well, yeah. So, one thing is the feature group, the 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 feature flag. We should really be getting rid of that. That this should become like, you know, this API groups versioning. This should become a standard feature, not just a feature flag. So we should be looking to make that part of the main uh, thing, either as a you know, it shouldn't be something that you have to turn on. Uh, I think that's a separate issue. I I I have a slightly different opinion because. If you enable this one, uh, I check the documentation. This one will force Valero to back up multiple versions for a resource, but this is not necessary in most cases. But it might actually be good because that means that we'd ha we'd be able to. So in that case, we could actually tell which one was available, and we could tell the. You know, I wonder if I wonder if this would so. So it might make sense. So there's a preferred version, but also that um, configuration tells you which one was used to create it, right? So um, when you got it, there was that, I forget what the string exactly, but it showed the, the how it was created and what version of the API was used to create it. And maybe the right thing to do is to create it the same way it was originally created. So that's another 
I don't think we need the other flag because with this feature gate plus this config map, we have uh, enough flexibility to you know maneuver the version. Well, except as you say, this is this is an override. So what's the default behavior? The default behavior is the preferred version. I think it's the right thing to do. Well, but it's not working. Yeah, that's because there's a bug in Kubernetes, right? Well, yes, if, but, if, yeah. but if, if the intent is to put the system back the way it was, you're going to get better results if you, if you restore the API, if you restore the, the resource the same way it was originally created. So the last oh, applied yeah. configuration up there, it shows that it was created using the beta one API. I, I, I think uh, first, let me fix the issue by adding a item back, uh, I mean, backup item action plugin, but I, I, this uh, to back up the original version, I think we should double check because in other case, this may fail. Um, um, for example, um, if, if we back up uh, this resource and try to migrate to a newer uh, version where the V1 beta one resource is removed. The well, no, default. that's when, well, but the, so the feature group, the, the um, I, I can't say it right, but the group API version, that's supposed to handle the upgrade case. Uh, you're saying Kubernetes will handle that? No, our, our, that feature that's currently optional, but that should really be part of our mainstream feature. So either it works and we put it in or it doesn't work and we take it out, one or the other. I, I don't like this feature flag thing because that's, if, if, it's, if it's working, it should be a feature. You know, it should be part of it. Uh -oh. And it should be controllable. Maybe if it needs to be turned off, it should be controllable on a per backup basis. But um, feature flags are for things we don't think work. Okay, so that's a more general issue. Like uh, if you want to, because this is like a per Valero or per instance. Uh, right. Well, so feature flags are for things that we're testing that we're not sure work. Either this thing works or it doesn't. You know, it's been in there for a couple of releases now, but we're not really, you know, it, it's going to continue. Having this optional feature means that it doesn't always get tested. I mean, there is a test for it explicitly, okay. but everything else doesn't get tested with it, right? Okay. So feature flags should be something that are there temporarily and our plan is to remove them and not to remove the feature, but to enable the feature everywhere. Okay, so so you're saying we may move this switch from a Valero base to a per backup base? If necessary, right? And, you know, is it is it something that we would want to, or maybe it's just always on, right? Is there a reason to not have it on? Yeah, the reason for not having it on is we probably, we don't want the overhead to back up multiple version. That doesn't cost much. I mean, you know, it's an extra K per resource, right? Maybe. Um, and you'd have to have multiple versions, right? So as the, as the beta one versions go away, we're not backing them up. I do not disagree, but let me open another issue to discuss this. Yes, definitely it's a different definitely that's yeah. a different issue. But yeah. um, but I think that you know we want to have that, we want to have this feature flag, we want to have the feature merged and be a mainstream feature. And whether it's enabled on a per backup basis or not is another question. So you're saying all these feature gates, if they're mature, we should you know merge yes. them. Okay. Yeah. Yes, because feature gates, because we're not testing everything together, right? We only, te we only test with this thing enabled for that one test and everything else is testing without it. So, mm. you know, we- okay. okay, I'll, I'll open an issue for discussion and uh, can schedule this change in some future release. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but it was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to let them put in this big change to try it for a while. Uh -huh. but it's not supposed to be a permanent feature. You know, it, it, it's, it's different. It, it's, yeah. you know, it, it's, yeah, anyways. Um, so do you think 
uh, it's worth to you know check with other guys about this bug in Kubernetes. I'm not sure how often does this happen. I assume it's it should really happen. Right. So, um, so who's report? So the reporter on this is is TMC or just some yeah, other it's person? Not a TMC. A TMC is saying this issue is they are seeing the same issue when they are doing uh, backup and recovery on Azure, but this is not mm -hmm. an Azure specific issue. It looks like a bug in you know the conversion code for right. this particular resource. It sounds like it's it's happening twice though in two different places then. Correct. Um, yeah, we can try and push it back. Well, I, I don't know. I suppose we probably need to go and take it to the Kubernetes mm -hmm. uh, core folks and just let them know and maybe open a bug for them and just report what's happening and see what they say. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'll write up an issue. I'm not sure how they're going to prioritize it because it's going to be removed. I mean, it, even if yeah. even if they do fix it you know, or you have to fix it in the future, that still requires that Kubernetes upgrade in order for it to work for us, right? Right, right. Yeah. So I think um, I think fixing it in our code one way or the other, you know, like if you put together either a restore, a backup item action, or I think a restore item action is actually the right thing um, to handle it on the restore side. So then any backups that are there that are broken now would, would get better, right? Um, Yeah, yeah, I, I think probably that's a better choice. But so backup item action also makes sense so that in the backup it doesn't have a, a invalid value. But yeah. Yeah. But, you but the they're already there. There's already backups being yeah. created that have those. Correct. Yep. But I'm not sure how, I mean, would, would we have to make it where it's like specific for this resource? I think so, because this is a so, bug for this one. So there's that one, and then we have to make one for the Azure problem as well. We'll say it again. I, I didn't get so it. There's another. So TMC is reporting an issue with Azure. It's not this issue, though. It's similar. It's the exactly the same issue. I mean, but is it? But it, but it is exactly the same resource. Yes. Oh, okay. So then, if you if you fix that, so this so fix for this will fix their issue as well. Right. Oh, okay. Then that's easy. So at least there's not two instances of it. Yep. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments for this one? If not, um, uh, there's another discussion item I put, I think. Uh, I just want to point out as uh, Bruce is uh, migrating the CRD uh, from using Builder V2 to V3. So the CRD will all be only uh, shipping V1 CRD for Valero in future. So that means starting from version 1.8, Valero will only work on 1.16 and later versions of Kubernetes. I just want to notify the uh, community about this. Uh, yeah, would you put that on the, uh, for next week as well, since this week it's pretty much only the VMware team who, who came. Okay, I will, yeah. Yeah. And and you can you can put it tag me on it and I'll I'll make sure everybody's up to date about it. Yep. Uh, I, I think we're gonna make sure this one uh mentioned this in the release note of one night. Yes, but probably we want some comment earlier, just you know, give some heads up and see if anybody really has an issue. But we were kind of planning to do that anyway originally. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's all from my part. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, next is from uh, Dell draft a proposal for perlin space multi tenants PR. Dell, do you want to share share screen or? Yeah, let's see if I can get that out here. So, how's that show? Um, so this was a idea that I had, and I just wanted to write it up. I don't think we've got it on our roadmap yet, but I wanted to write it up and get it in so that we'd have it as a, as a thought and get some comment early on because people have asked for this multi-tenancy. So, um, so the way we've been thinking about it, there's, there's basically two ways to do multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. 
One is to do a um, like a Kubernetes cluster per group. And that we already handle because you just install Bolero in the cluster. But then there's other people who are building out large Kubernetes clusters and they want this to be um, broken up for different groups and they'll assign each group or user a namespace. And they only really get rights to run things and do things inside the namespace. And so there's been an ask for, hey, how could you support, um, how could you support this? Um, so the idea that I had was that we should have this, we could have this um, uh, multi-tenancy on per namespace basis, um, get the same level of, so we don't wanna have the same level of isolation as the Kubernetes RBAC is currently providing. So we don't need to give more than is already provided, but we shouldn't provide less. And get as many of the features that we can working and then um, also be able to support multiple Valero instances running in a cluster. So this approach has uh, a Valero instance that is then uh, able to be controlled by multiple users. Okay. Let's see. I'm actually, show hey, how about this. Ah, okay, good. So here now we can actually see the diagrams. So currently, the Valero model for security is it's all about who can read and write resources into the Valero namespace. So if you can write a resource into the Valero namespace, you get to control Valero. So you can write a backup resource, you can write a restore resource, you can write a delete um, backup resource. And you can you know, read statuses and so forth from it. And that's all controlled by the Kubernetes permissions, whether or not you have permission to access that namespace. And in fact, you could, you know, your permissions as a user might be that you can only access the namespace. Valero could actually be running with higher permissions, such as cl um, like cluster admin, and it will do things on your behalf, even though you don't actually have cluster admin. It's kind of an interesting thing there. So that's kind of our current model. And that means that anybody who has this Valero admin credential can do any Valero operation. So they can delete all of the backups, they can restore into any namespace, they can even create new namespaces and restore into them using Valero. They can overwrite the entire cluster or at least restore into the cluster. We don't do overwrite right now, but anything that wasn't there would get um, recreated. CRDs can be recreated and so forth. So I was thinking about this and that we, we've talked about being able to do like self-service backup and restore, which means that you can backup and restore your namespace, but not somebody else's and not interfere with their stuff. And the thought I had was that we could do this by um, changing Valero a bit. So it has like a multi-tenancy mode. And in the multi-tenancy mode, Valero can watch for resources in other namespaces. And what you would do is the user to enable this is you would need to create a backup storage location and you would also need to create a backup storage location credential. And so the credential would be like your S3 bucket and you know username password type stuff. And that way, um, in order to access the bucket, you have to show that you have access to the credentials. And kind of the, the thinking that I'm going through here is that we don't want Valero to start implementing its own uh, permission model and RBAC controls. What we want it to do is to um, continue to use the existing Kubernetes stuff. So how can we do this where we can say this user is allowed to access something, but not, not make Valero work too hard in terms of figuring out what they're allowed to access. So the solution that I'm proposing here is that we do this by having a credential and a backup storage location in their namespace. And when Valero sees this, it would go ahead and it would you know, connect to that bucket and it would sync all the backup resources into this namespace. And if it sees a new um, resource created here, it would, it would go ahead and do the backup. Now it would also, if it, if it saw it in this multi-tenant mode, if it saw it in a non, there'd be one master namespace that would still work the same way. But any other namespace, if you create a backup resource here, it, um, you have to have your backup storage location set up and then it's only gonna allow you to backup things that are inside your namespace. 
So it would only back up all, and we could do this by like enforcing that the cluster, um, you know, it, it can't back up the cluster resources and um, we could enforce the namespace that we're backing up. And then each user then can have a separate backup storage location. So they can each have their own bucket to go in and they wouldn't see each other's backups. And the only place it can restore is into a namespace. So if they wanted, um, so either they might have like a new namespace, an empty namespace that's created, they'd have to configure it with the backup storage location in the credential, and then the inventory gets filled in, then they can restore into it. So that's kind of the idea. Scheduling would work the same way and deleting would work the same way. Um, any questions on this? So in each of them, there's there is still support multiple backup location with multiple uh, backup location credential? Yeah, so each namespace, you could have more than one there, sure. Um, but for example, the, I think about an issue like when you're doing restore, we create some global uh, config map to, to to tweak the behavior. Yeah, so that would that would have to be moved to be a local thing. So there's going to be limitations as to what you can do. Yeah, I, I think there'll be maybe more details we, we need to think about. So, so you're saying that we are not checking user permission in Valero's code. We just make sure if a backup resource exists in a, names, in a user namespace, um, this backup resource will only backup the resource in the user namespace, the yes. same one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd have to go to a backup storage location that was in that namespace. And the same for a restore. So you have to restore a backup from a backup resource that was in your namespace. You couldn't do it from, you know, you couldn't specify something else. But how, for example, if user two is doing a backup in mm -hmm. his bucket and user one somehow, so the only protection is the S3 credential. Like if he knows user two's mm -hmm. uh, cloud credential, he will be able to restore on another class or um, yes and that's currently the case yeah. yeah yeah so definitely the credential needs to be secret but that's already the case i mean if they get your credential they can access your s3 bucket um any any different way and we could potentially have things like encryption and per user keys and then you need both the credential and the key so that that could be an option but that would require that we implement the encryption. Yeah, another question is, uh, if we if there's still multiple Velour instance in single cluster, uh, mm -hmm. how do you uh, Velour instance know which, uh, I mean, which user namespace should this uh, Velour instance to need to monitor? Yeah, so I was thinking that one, there's a mode. So first off, you'd have to you'd have to enable this cluster, this this Valero, to run in multi-tenant mode. And two, and I did I need to add this to this document. I was writing it in the Slack channel. And two, there would be a um, a control in each Valero install as to which namespaces it should monitor. So you could write like monitor everything, or you could write you know monitor only these namespaces that I'm listing. And we need some kind of a locking mechanism to ensure that they don't run into each other. Yeah. But user namespace may uh, also change it, right? Sometimes user may delete that. So mm -hmm. if that happened, uh, how, this, uh, if, um, how this can be synced to Velour instance? No, this namespace was removed. Uh, so the Velour so, instance. So I think the, the concept of running multiple Valeros simultaneously is useful, but it's not like a standard use case. 
And so the standard use case would be you have one Valero running, you say, I want to run in multi-tenant mode and you tell it to monitor everything. Okay. And then, you know, back if namespaces come and go, it's not a problem. Another, another uh, issue I can think of right now is performance because when user uh, write backup resources in his own namespace, uh, you know, concurrently, Valero is still a single thread model. Yes, yes, definitely. And I, that's actually listed down at the bottom of this. Um, we would probably need to implement parallelism because it's not just performance, it's just like uh, denial of service, right? So one yeah. user could basically lock the system up by running a long running backup. Yeah. So we'll, we'll probably need some form of parallelism before we could implement this. So this is like a very early design proposal and mm -hmm. definitely, you know, room to add comments. It's not like, hey, this is something we're going to do, but we've been talking about this for a while. So I wanted to kind of get this idea out there. We may use a completely different idea, okay. but just have us be able to think about the issues because these are very good issues that everybody's bringing up. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So the uh, running multiple uh, backup job uh, in single instance need to be implemented uh, before before we we can uh, I mean reach this uh, multi tenancy mode. Yep, and so that's that's something that you know came out of this discussion that we probably hadn't been thinking about before. So it's like, oh yeah, okay. So we want multi tenancy. We have to do you know, parallel backups. Yeah. Um, and there's some, what happened with my format here? There's some weirdnesses around snapshots and um, credentials for the snapshots that would need to be thought through. Um, I also don't, the, the model that's here lets each user monitor their own things but in order for the admin to monitor everything, they'd have to be able to read everybody's um, namespace, or we'd have to like mirror the resources into the Valero namespace. So that may be a little weird. So that's what's another- the, What's the reason we, we do not choose to install Valero in different uh, user namespace? Well, so if we install it in each one, so right now, Valero requires uh, cluster admin per permissions in order to do backups. So we could consider having a mode where it doesn't need those, right. but we don't have that at the moment. So that's another option. Uh -huh. um, but then we also, we would not have, for example, like a central, we, we aren't sharing resources. Each user has their own instance of Valero and they'd have to have credentials um, for not just um, well, actually, one of, one of the issues with the snapshotting is it, it catches you kind of both ways. So I guess with CSI snapshotting, you don't need the, the Valero doesn't need a credential for the storage system. With the legacy snapshotters, it does need a credential. And that means that each user would have to have permission to access the, um, the storage system and take snapshots. Mm -hmm. And so they could potentially interfere with each other that way. Mm -hmm. um, and if we had multiple Valeros installed, then um, you get the parallelism, but you also lose control. I mean, if everybody starts a backup simultaneously, maybe that's too much for the system and you don't have a way to throttle that. So those are things to consider. Oops. So anyway, this is here. Um, feel free to look it over and add comments and we'll kind of work on it for a while. I don't think this is due in any you know, particular release. So this PR can sit out for a while as just a design proposal. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so that was it for me on that. Thank you, Dan. And, uh... Anyone has any questions for this meeting?
Okay, we have no question. Uh, I think we can end this meeting. Um, thank you, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for hosting, Wenkai. <laughs>